So now, let's take a little closer look at the components of the immune response. At first glance, the complement cascade may appear daunting. The most important concepts to understand, however, are the stimuli for the different pathways and the consequences of poor or non-functioning components of the complement system. There are three pathways of complement activation, all of which converge upon the formation of the membrane attack complex, the role of which is to defend against gram-negative bacteria. The classical pathway of complement activation occurs via IgG and IgM, while the lectin and alternative pathways are activated by microbial surface molecules. Take some time to look over the complement pathway. Note that two byproducts of complement activation, C3A and C5A, are also mediators of anaphylaxis. Further down the pathway, the membrane attack complex forms in the membrane of the target cell with the convergence of C5B and C6, C7, C8, and C9, leading to cell lysis. This complex is especially important in fighting Neisseria infections, so patients with deficiencies in these complement proteins suffer from frequent Neisseria infections. Speaking of deficiencies, deficiencies of various aspects of the complement cascade are fairly high yield topics, so you might want to take some time to commit them to memory. Hereditary angioedema, for example, classically manifested by impressive and even life-threatening swelling of the face and airways, is the result of deficiency in C1 esterase inhibitor. C1 esterase inhibitor prevents complement activation against self-cells. Decay accelerating factor, or DAF, is another regulatory component in the complement cascade, the deficiency of which results in lysis of red blood cells and manifests as paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. A deficiency in C3 results in recurrent sinus and respiratory tract infections and an increase in susceptibility to type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. This latter feature makes sense when you understand the role of C3B in clearing immune complexes. As mentioned before, deficiencies in C5 through C8, which form the membrane attack complex, lead to recurrent Neisseria infections. Finally, you may see deficiency in DAF, or decay accelerating factor, which is another regulatory component in the complement cascade, the deficiency of which results in lysis of red blood cells and manifests as paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. This is a high-yield topic that will emerge again and again on important tests throughout your career. A helpful way to start understanding the various cytokines is first by separating them on the basis of where they're produced. Macrophages and T-cells are the main cell types that produce cytokines. Macrophages produce IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, IL-12, and TNF-alpha. T-cells are responsible for secreting IL-3, as well as IL-2, interferon gamma, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-10. Several of these have already been discussed, but we'll still review them. Even more important than where cytokines are secreted is what function they serve. Let's walk through the different cytokines in a somewhat numerical order for the sake of looking at things a little differently than they are in the book. IL-1 is an endogenous pyrogen responsible for fever. It's thought that IL-1 is produced by collapse of distal alveoli, i.e. atelectasis, and is responsible for immediate postoperative fever. IL-2 stimulates growth of helper and cytotoxic T-cells. IL-3 supports growth and differentiation of bone marrow stem cells. IL-4 induces Th2 differentiation and enhances class switching to IgE and IgG in B cells. IL-5 also promotes differentiation of B cells and enhances class switching to IgA. IL-5 also stimulates eosinophils. IL-6 is another endogenous pyrogen. It causes some degree of fever as well as stimulates production of acute phase proteins. Anemia of chronic disease is associated with elevations in IL-6. IL-8 is a chemotactic factor for neutrophils. IL-10 is a counter-regulatory cytokine that modulates the inflammatory response by inhibiting Th1 cells. IL-12 induces the differentiation of T cells into Th1 cells and activates NK cells. Two other cytokines are interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. Interferon gamma is a member of a class of cytokines known as interferons, of which there's also interferon beta and interferon alpha. These proteins place uninfected cells in an antiviral state and inhibit viral protein synthesis through the degradation of viral mRNA. The alpha and beta interferons in particular inhibit viral protein synthesis, while interferon gamma activates macrophages, Th1 cells, and NK cells. This latter interferon also has anti-tumor properties. You should appreciate the importance of cell surface proteins, as well as recognize the types of cells to which each belongs. The latter is the highest yield approach to understanding cell surface proteins. As you memorize this list of cell types and their cell surface proteins, pause for a moment to recall the roles they might play in B and T cell activation, as well as antigen presentation. This will help reinforce some of the concepts we've discussed already. Unfortunately, when it comes to this part of immunology, there's no real way around just memorizing some information. 
We've discussed this before, but again briefly, energy refers to the state in which immune cells become non-reactive after encountering one type of stimulatory molecule without also encountering the appropriate co-stimulator. This prevents massive inappropriate immune activation, which could lead to inadvertent harm to the organism. Certain bacterial toxins work by inappropriately activating the host's immune system. The toxins of S. pyogenes and S. aureus, for example, are capable of cross-linking the beta regions of T-cell receptors to the MHC2 molecules on antigen-presenting cells, which causes a massive release of interferon gamma from Th1 cells, which in turn triggers release of IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha from macrophages, resulting in a massive autoimmune response which can lead to shock. Endotoxins and lipopolysaccharides from gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, stimulate macrophages directly through interaction with CD14. In this way, they bypass Th cells altogether. Obviously, if you're a pathogen, the last thing you want to do is be seen by the immune system and killed off by a host's immunologic retaliation. In order to prevent this, a lot of different pathogens have evolved novel ways to avoid detection, sort of like camouflage on a cellular level. They do this by changing the antigens they present to the surrounding environment, making it harder for the immune system to recognize them as pathogens and mount a rapid response. Some mechanisms by which pathogens do this include DNA rearrangement and RNA segment reassortment. Salmonella's flagellae, Neisseria's pilases, and Borrelia are all capable of undergoing antigen shift in order to avoid detection, as are influenza and trypanosomes. While we've already split the immune system into the innate and adaptive categories, it can also be divided into both a passive and an active arm. Passive immunity is the quicker of the two to act. It relies on the acquisition of preformed antibodies, such as through breast milk in the newborn, or the injection of antitoxins or humanized monoclonal antibodies. Unfortunately, it has a short half-life of only about three weeks. Nevertheless, physicians make use of this principle when administering preformed antibodies to treat several diseases, including tetanus, botulism, HBV, and rabies. The active arm works a little differently. Despite the name, it's actually the slower of the two to act. Active immunity to a specific antigen comes about after an organism has been exposed to that antigen for the first time, usually through direct infection or vaccination. You can remember the previous fact about administration of antibodies for passive immunity with the mnemonic to be healed rapidly for tetanus toxin, botulinum toxin, HPV, or rabies. Next we'll talk about vaccination, which is the administration of viral particles or synthetic analogs in order to induce active immunity. One type of vaccination is live attenuated, which involves the injection of viral particles that have lost their infectivity in humans through multigenerational passage in other organisms, but still remain similar enough to the human infecting variety to induce immunity. Important examples include measles, mumps, the Sabin polio vaccine, rubella, varicella, or chickenpox, and yellow fever. The advantage is that it induces long-lived immunity, but the downside is that it can sometimes revert to an infectious form. This mainly induces a cellular response. Inactivated or killed vaccines make use of viral particles that have been rendered non-infectious through exposure to heat or chemicals, though again, it can still induce an active immune response because epitopes remain intact. It's more stable than live vaccines, but usually it requires booster shots. Cholera, flu, hep A, the Salk polio vaccine, and the rabies vaccine are all cogent examples. Killed vaccines induce what's called humoral immunity. Let's return our discussion to hypersensitivity reactions, which is potentially the highest yield concept for the boards in this chapter. There are four types of hypersensitivity reactions. Types 1, 2, and 3 are antibody-mediated, while type 4 is cell-mediated. Let's discuss each type and some examples. Later, you'll be presented with some vignettes to help test your understanding. Type 1 hypersensitivity reactions occur when free antigen cross-links IgE. On presensitized mast cells and basophils, this cross-linking triggers release of histamine, bradykinin, and other vasoactive amines. Atopy and anaphylaxis are classic examples of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. If you picture an anaphylactic reaction to peanuts or bee stings, for example, this should reinforce how rapidly this type of hypersensitivity can develop. Atopic reactions, such as rhinitis, hay fever, asthma, and eczema, are all examples of type 1 hypersensitivity. Type 2 hypersensitivity is antibody-mediated by three mechanisms. IgM and IgG are the antibodies that mediate this type of hypersensitivity. When either binds fixed antigen on a foreign cell, this triggers a series of events ending in lysis or phagocytosis of that cell. Type 3 hypersensitivity involves immune complex formation and activation of complement. When antigen-antibody complexes activate complement, neutrophils are attracted to the area of deposition with subsequent release of lysosomal enzymes and destruction of the complex. Typically, type 3 hypersensitivity presents localized to the sites of immune complex deposition. 
Think about this for a moment as you look over the list of type 3 hypersensitivity reactions, as well as how the immune complex deposition manifests in the different pathologies. Serum sickness and the Arthas reaction are classic examples of type 3 hypersensitivity. Drug reactions constitute the majority of type 3 hypersensitivity witnessed clinically. Finally, we come to type 4, the only cell-mediated reaction, also known as delayed type hypersensitivity, as it occurs when sensitized T cells encounter antigen and release lymphokines. This type of hypersensitivity is implicated in transplant rejection and contact dermatitis. The common PPD skin test for tuberculosis also relies on delayed type hypersensitivity in its results. So here we'll briefly go through some of the major examples of the different types of hypersensitivity reactions. Let's start with type 1. The most important example of a type 1 reaction you should know is anaphylactic shock, which you often see caused by bee stings or food and drug allergies. This is the culprit when you hear about a kid with peanut allergies eating something with peanut oil in a restaurant and suddenly not being able to breathe. On a slightly less life-threatening note, common seasonal allergy symptoms like rhinitis, hay fever, hives, and asthma also fall under this category. When it comes to type 2 reactions, the thing to keep in mind is that the disease tends to be specific to the place where the antigen is found. Pernicious anemia, for example, involves destruction of intrinsic factor-producing parietal cells in the stomach because the immune system recognizes epitopes on these cells as foreign and attacks them. Hemolytic anemia, good pasture syndrome, Graves' disease, and myasthenia gravis are also good examples that often show up on board's questions. Type 3 reactions involve formation of immune complexes, as previously mentioned, and often show systemic manifestations. Think of type 3 when you see an autoimmune disease that's affecting many areas or many different organ systems. The classic example is, of course, lupus, which very frequently shows up on board's questions, despite the assertion by some physicians in the real world when diagnosing diseases that it's never lupus. Questions involving type 4 reactions are usually given away pretty easily by the chronology of the symptoms. Type 4 reactions are delayed reactions, meaning the patient doesn't begin to experience symptoms until sometime after the initial insult. Two of the most important examples that you'll see on the boards are the PPD skin test for tuberculosis, which requires one to wait a few days before their test can be read, and a reaction to poison ivy, which might be slightly confusing at first blush to some because other reactions to plants like peanut allergies or hay fever are type 1. 